Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Are my intro satisfying? Satisfactory? Or should I be like, Hey guys, welcome back. It's me, McJibbin. We're here with another history video. Let's learn. On Christmas Eve 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Oh, but for real, let's let's do it. Preemptive like the other great the other great game. Well, I don't know what the Okay. The other great game, Britain versus the United States, 1814 to 46. Old Britannia. Good videos. They say, look, they say they've been watched or started the next ones, which I'm going to do. I have not seen them. Or I have not. Maybe I let it going and it went through all of them. I have not seen them. Let's go. On Christmas Eve 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed, bringing to an end the War of 1812. It had been an inconclusive conflict, and the stalemate was reflected in the peace terms, which, with the exception of native tribes... Guys, I, I was not ready. I was not ready. It really... On Christmas Eve 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed, bringing to an end the War of 1812. It had been an inconclusive conflict, and the stalemate was reflected in the peace terms, which, with the exception of native tribes, effectively returned North America to the status quo antebellum. It did, however, end 30 years of uncertainty. Henceforth, there was to be no question of Britain reasserting control over her former colonies. Likewise, an American annexation of Canada previously thought inevitable, now seemed improbable. The ostensible cause of Dang. the war had been disputes Joking. relating to British views on marriage. I gotta stop talking. American annexable cause Canada, previously thought inevitable, now seemed improbable. The ostensible cause of the war had been disputes relating to British views on maritime rights, though the real tension had been created by America and Britain's mutual suspicion of one another. For most of the 19th century, relations were bedeviled by largely unnecessary problems of psychological adjustment. British politicians remained suspicious of a Republican regime. American policymakers were determined that London should not manipulate their nation, as she seemed to manipulate others. There were three broad categories disputes between the two nations fell into in this time period. The first and most important was the issue of neutral rights in wartime including the right of search, blockade, and the explosive issue of slavery, for Britain considered itself at war with slavers. The second were issues related to conflicts of interest, for example, territorial fishing or commercial disputes. The third were issues of high politics, particularly attitudes towards Latin American countries and European involvement in American affairs. In general, Britain... Um, I might have said this before, but I need to find a video on it, if anyone has one in the comments uh, or on discord if you could link it but britain in terms of other countries is certainly the united states but i think overall a lot of the countries in europe was pretty ahead of its time in denouncing slavery when others were were in full gear of still exploiting it um i'd like to learn what sort of led them to that that that'd be interesting and isn't wasn't a, a, impressment a thing where um i'm asking you guys i really don't know if i'm right impressment where britain would sometimes or was this during the revolution would sometimes stop american ships and like uh if they thought they were british deserters because it was more difficult to distinguish between british and american pe people because we were still so connected, similar accents, and, and they'd take them onto their ship. So, all right. American so, let's countries go. and European involvement in American affairs. Monroe, Dosh. In general, British policy right. was passive, American policy bellicose. The first major problem after Ghent was the question of armaments on the Great Lakes. Britain wished for disarmament and the United States the opposite. But the expense of maintaining rival forces was great to both nations. So in 1817, the American ambassador to London, Adams, suggested the what? United States the opposite. But the expense of maintaining rival forces was Okay, the expense of maintaining rival of maintaining a fleet on was great to both nations. So in 1817, the American ambassador to London, Adams, suggested disarmament. 
It was now Britain's turn to play coy. A section of the cabinet thought doing so would leave Canada defenceless. The British Foreign Secretary, Castlereagh, was, however, willing to negotiate. In 1817, the Rush Bagot Agreement was prepared and ratified by the Senate the next year. Each power was restricted to only four lightly armed boats on all lakes, effectively neutralizing them, and thus the American Canadian frontier was opened. Can That's not even one boat per lake. Okay, so yeah, essentially neutralizing them, and thus the American Canadian frontier was opened. Castlereagh hoped to build on this positive step and resolve further issues, particularly the question of commercial rights, where Britain hoped to take part in the interstate carrying trade, whilst America wanted the West Indian colonies to be open to their merchants. But the Commercial Convention of 1818 failed to satisfy either power. It did, however, touch upon some other points of dispute. The Tsar was asked to arbitrate on the matter of what compensation Britain would pay for slaves who had fled to them for protection in the war. Whilst it proved impossible to reach an agreement on the main Canada boundary, the 49th parallel was accepted as the border from the Lake of the Woods to the Rockies. The area of Oregon, which was under dispute by both, was to be left open to either nation's citizens and commerce for 10 years. The agreements of 1818 did then represent a considerable advancement in Anglo-American relations. Tensions, however, remained fraught. Anti-Americanism found little stock in Britain, apart from a few jingos like Palmerston and among high Tories, but there was a serious Anglophobic lobby in the United States, who saw the settlements of 1783 and 1814 only as respites before the struggle to destroy British influence in the Americas resumed. Castlereagh was fundamentally correct when he argued time. Interesting. So, achieving independence from Britain and, you know, being able to hold them off again. I don't know enough about the War of 1812 to say, like, we beat them and it's. Um, but then, so both the. I always find this fascinating to think about the earlier years of the of the country. So both both winning the war of independence on our part and you know settling the war of 1812 were just like all right it's just a matter of time before we fight again to retake all of North America. I mean this was Spanish territory, right? Okay. In the Americas resumed. Castle Ray before the struggle to destroy British influence in the Americas resumed. Castlereagh was fundamentally correct when he argued time can do more than we can, though Anglophobes like Jackson were determined that this time should not be available. The issue of greatest international importance which faced the United States between 1814 and 1829 was that of the independence of the Spanish colonies. Neither British or American interests aligned here, but both agreed that Spanish control should not be reasserted via the intervention of other European powers. There was thus the framework for some sort of joint policy, though it was impaired by America's tendency not to distinguish Britain from the other interventionist European powers. Understood. The main policy divergence was on the issue of the rebellions against Spanish rule. In 1817, Castlereagh wished to avoid America recognizing the independence of these new states, as doing so would force Britain to make a premature choice between following the American lead or supporting the intervention of the European powers that wanted to crush the rebellion. Interesting. Adams failed to grasp Castlereagh. Okay, so um, just to solidify what I just learned there, we're at 4.33, okay? So Britain and America, who are both looking at each other skeptical and in America wanting to expand and, and uh, you know, get more and more British territory in North America. So they're against each other there, obviously. But they both want to weaken Spanish influence in uh, the other parts of the Americas. But it's not as if they're an alliance in that. It's just, well, uh, America still sees Britain just as it sees, you know, Portugal or Spain, right? And so... Okay, this is, is like, so they have to worry, so they want to, like, tackle it with America to get rid of Spanish influence, but they're also skeptical that America will recognize these places in a way that goes against Britain's interest. 
I okay. Written from the other each in a moment. We were at 433. Adams failed to grasp Castlereagh's reasoning, but did nonetheless hold back recognition for fear of invoking his wrath. By 1818, the obstinacy of Spain meant Britain increasingly leaned towards recognition of the insurgent what? states. What? I don't, uh... The rebellions. Or supporting the intervention of the European powers that wanted to crush the rebellions. Adams failed to grasp Castlereagh's reasoning, but did nonetheless hold back recognition for fear of invoking his wrath. By 1818, the obstinacy of Spain meant Britain increasingly leaned towards recognition of the insurgent states and suggested a joint mediation with Washington. Adams finally understood British policy and reported to Monroe's cabinet, it is our true policy to let this experiment have its full effect without attempting to disturb it, which might unnecessarily give offence to the Allies. But this brief cooperation with Britain had for the moment to be abandoned over a conflict in Florida. In 1818, Jackson invaded the territory, raising concern in London, which preferred a state so close to the West Indies to remain in the possession of the unthreatening Spanish. The fear was reinforced by Jackson's arbitrary and indefensible execution of two British subjects. Public opinion in Britain was- So Britain's position here is very, it seems to be the most complicated one, in that it wants to get rid of other European powers influence over these other, you know, more in the Central and S Southern America, Central and South America, just like the U.S. wants to, but they also don't want the U.S. to get too much, and the U.S.'s position is much more straightforward. It's just all of you uh, European powers influencing North and South America are all the same, and we want to reduce all of your influence. So the U.K. has to do this very delicate, you know, aid, uh, you know, duo with the U.S. in certain areas, but also go uh, stop helping the U.S. or going against them in other areas where they don't want them to encroach. An indefensible execution of two British Please subjects. let me know if, uh, if I am uh, miss, if I'm wrong. West Indies to remain in the possession of the unthreatening Spanish. The fear was reinforced by Jackson's arbitrary and indefensible execution of two British subjects. Public opinion in Britain was outraged, but Castlereagh remained calm. He instead attempted to display British goodwill towards the US by pressing the Spanish to sign a treaty in 1819 which allowed for an American occupation of Florida. Under Castlereagh's successor, what? Canning, the Latin American crisis became acute. In 1823, the United States promulgated the Monroe Doctrine, which declared the American continents are henceforth. I, that didn't make any sense. So, so America. So the UK was against. I know this can be annoying, guys, but like, I, if I'm not gonna learn, then I, what's the point? So I'm. Uh, help. So Britain was against the U.S. getting Florida because they would be too close to less threatening powers in this area. But then the U.S. supposedly killed two British people. And in response, they let them, the British let them have Florida. The canning, the Latin American crisis became acute. In 1823, the United States promulgated the Monroe Doctrine, which declared the American continents are henceforth not to be to be considered as future subjects for colonization by any European power. The most interesting aspect of this was that it was an assertion of an unenforceable ideal. American <laughs> sure. resources were unequal to the requirements of such a policy, and hence many in Europe thought it must have been drawn up in cooperation with Canning. This was false, but the disconcertion the impression caused in European courts suited him well enough. In 1824, he declared, The effect of the ultra-liberalism of our Yankee cooperators on the ultra-despotism of our A. La Chapelle allies gives me just the balance I wanted. See? Liberation... Brilliant! I love how Europe can do that. Europe does, and in European conflicts too, on the main, mainland Europe. It, it just... It's so overpowered, OP, that, you know, they have an insanely good navy and they're they're very near Europe but not touching it. And so they have this ability to just really play chess. I think that's a good I can use that here. Playing chess while others are playing checkers. I can that's actually correct here, right?
The Spanish America came to pale allies gives me just the balance I wanted. It's like, yeah, that works. When the liberation of Spanish America came and Britain extended diplomatic recognition, it was achieved in a fashion most favourable to British interests, though Canning was under no illusions that the United States still held ambitions of domination in the region. Initially, American opinion had been favourable to Canning's recognition of the insurgents. This quickly changed as it became clear to now President Adams that British and US interests were opposed in the region. South American states discovered that Canning's policy of non-intervention in the area would protect them from both Europe and the United States. They were thus inclined to draw closer to Britain rather than America. The dispute over Cuba in particular reinforced this point. The island remained under Spanish control, and in 1826 the Latin American states met to work out a framework for some kind of invasion. The US denounced any possible annexation, and thus created the entirely correct impression she had designs on the island herself. Canning further trapped the Americans by proposing a self-denying ordinance on the issue. Canning further trapped the Americans by proposing a self-denying ordinance on the issue that they obviously refused. The affair made it clear that whilst British policy was generally based upon commercial interests, the United States' was territorial. Thus, Adams had to recognise the balance of power in the region had shifted in Britain's favour. On the 3rd of January 1820, Clay told the Republic of Plata that the Monroe Dock... So, am I getting this right, guys? The reason that a lot of Latin... Uh... Central, Latin, and, and South American uh, countries are just powers down here. People are more in, inclined or would rather have British influence than American influence is because the British are seeking more just economic ties, whereas Americans, they'd be afraid of Americans pursuing direct invasion and control rather than just economic stuff am i am i am i understand to recognize the balance of power in the region had shifted in britain's favor on the 3rd of january 1820 clay told the republic of plata that the monroe doctrine must not be seen as conveying any pledge or obligation the performance of which foreign nations have a right to demand in effect the monroe doctrine had been suspended primarily as a result of british policy Clay's irritation soon made itself manifest in a resuscitation of petty squabbles. Postures taken up soon made itself manifest primarily as a result of British policy. Clay's irritation soon made itself manifest in a resuscitation of petty squabbles. Postures taken up in Congress seemed to suggest an American right to dictate trade policy in the West Indies, an area the British were particularly sensitive. On the 26th of July, 1826, an order in council prohibited all West Indian American trade in American ships. Adams then refused to allow British West Indian men to enter American ports. The result was disastrous for West Indian trade. There was also a total failure to convince the US to accept British anti-slaving measures, though this was understandable in view of the difficult domestic opposition Washington faced. The fall of Adams did little to improve relations. Jackson, the idol of the Democratic Party, was hardly the man to work with Palmerston, who had both an instinctive fear and contempt of Jackson's extension of the suffrage. But in the 1830s, relations did begin to ease. The US continued its territorial expansion, bringing into question once more the issue of the northern border and British fears, especially after the Senate refused to accept a very favourable settlement from the Dutch King's army. Oh, yeah, I'm right there. Oh, I'm, you can't really see me. It's too far down. I believe that the, and I think I've said this in a different video, but um, that a lot of the uh, discussion or, you know, mediation over what the this border would be between British Canada and uh, northern Maine here, it might have, was uh, that there's a lot of natural spring waters, and that obviously is an important thing. So a lot of good ways of, of obtaining uh, blah, 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 obtaining drinking water. I could arbitration. be again Tenet wrong. refused to accept a very favourable settlement from the Dutch King's arbitration in 1831. The security of Canada, the principal aim of Britain's American policy in this period, was further jeopardised by the 1837 rebellion. Though it was suppressed, it garnered substantial support in the US, and insurgents assembled on the American side of the Niagara, causing loyalist Canadian militias to cross the frontier to put them to flight. President Van Buren was calm and conciliatory throughout, and attempted to control extremists, for which Palmerston was very grateful. Yet anti-British feeling ran high. 
and the McLeod case of 1840 to 1841 did nothing to assuage passions. Palmerston declared that if McLeod were executed, there would be war. The Americans gave way, and McLeod, a fool deserving of little sympathy, was released. Uh, a Canadian that bragged about having killed Americans during the Carolean Affair, 1837, arrested in New York and charged with murder. Britain claimed he had acted under orders, but New York refused to acknowledge federal jurisdiction in the case, eventually acquitted under heavy British pressure. The age passions. Palmerston declared that if McLeod were executed, there would be... Sorry about right. ...was released. The major obstacle to good relations, apart from traditional Anglophobia in America, was the belief that Britain was determined to prevent the natural expansion of the United States. Every minor dispute came to be regarded in America as a test of national virility. Territorial disputes continued in the North, and local feeling ran high. In 1841, Webster, the Secretary of State, proposed new negotiations on the contentious Maine-Canada border. In 1842, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty was ratified by the Senate. It was subject to criticism in both countries, but was to prove a lasting settlement, even if it actually assigned the United States less than the award of 1831 had offered. There had also been some attempts in these negotiations to deal with the issue of British naval rights, but the dispute regarding Britain's right to search vessels was so toxic it ended up being dropped by Webster and Ashburton. It was, however, a problem that refused to go away. In December 1841, the European Great Powers concluded a treaty granting mutual rights of search. The days of slave traders were clearly numbered, though Aberdeen's invitation to the United States to also join the treaty was rejected. The reason was partly a paranoia about national sovereignty, which a British right to search would violate. Though this was an understandable... A slave trading... Well, these are really good. I would want to pause and read them. Slave trading was not really a question of, of morality at this point. The trade had been banned in 1807 by the U.S., who deployed their own, albeit small, naval force to suppress it. The issue was largely whether a moral cause should take precedence over national sovereignty. Fearfully, ...which a British right to search would violate. Though this was an understandable fear for a young nation, and one that is easy to sympathize with, on this issue in particular, it revealed the United States' immaturity as an international power. Until 1862, slavers would fly the Stars and Stripes to avoid interception by the Royal Navy. British policy elsewhere was less than sensible in this period. London was in favour of the status quo in the former Spanish colonies. Mexican rule, however, was weak and in the late 1830s destroyed in Texas. Aberdeen hoped to set up Texas as a buffer, but the southern states were in favour of annexation and all the recognition of independence by Britain in 1840 did was create justified and unnecessary resentment in the US. In 1846, Texas was annexed and the United States made major gains in the war with Mexico that followed. Aberdeen's chickens now Texas came home. Brother. That's where Texas comes in. Made major gains in the war with Mexico that followed. Jeez. Aberdeen's chickens now came home to roost. The failure of British policy in Texas meant activists urged President Polk to press their claims to Oregon more strongly, not considering that British interests were far more seriously at stake here. Thus, by involving British prestige needlessly in a weak case, Aberdeen now had to convince American opinion that British claims to Oregon were not also bluster. In the 1844 presidential Appeasement. election, the Democratic Party adopted the slogan 5440 or fight, a reference to the extreme northern limit of the American claim. Aberdeen tried to compromise by suggesting the Columbian River as a border, but Polk declared in his inaugural address that American claims I wonder if 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 this if we did get this much if if that's north enough to connect with Alaska. Like I wonder if this were the borders of the US if you could actually drive from the main states to Alaska without having to go through Canada. Columbia northern limit of the American claim. Aberdeen tried to compromise by suggesting the Columbian River as a border, but Polk declared in his inaugural address that American claims were unquestionable, a statement which was as provocative as it was false. The two nations trembled on the brink of war until 1846. When, faced with a conflict in Mexico, Polk agreed to a compromise that saw the 49th parallel agreed as the frontier, which apart from a slight alteration in 1871, decided the American-Canadian border and removed a serious point of conflict. The Oregon dispute in particular revealed some of the abiding weaknesses in Anglo-American relations. There was a fundamental mistrust between the countries, 
each nation suspected the other of illegitimate ambition. British foreign secretaries tended to see the United States as a brash, insensitive power, seeking domination of the New World and its trade. American secretaries of state tended to see Britain as a typical European power, anti-democratic, imperialist, and hostile to the natural extensions of American power. Bluster and threat thus became a normal part of diplomatic exchanges. Palmerston declared, with such cunning fellows as these Yankees, it never answers to give way. Whilst Polk summed up the American position in arguing, the only way to treat John Bull is to look him in the eye. When views such as these were predominant among policy makers, it's hardly surprising that Anglo-American relations could not settle down. Am I crazy to think this is kind of reminding me of like, uh, like American wanting uh, Leben, Leben's rum? Like, like in World War Two, like just, I, I guess that maybe that's unfair. Uh, but it just seems like America's, and I mean, hey, uh, yeah, America's trying to dominate the territory and trade of the region. Well, of course, but what do you think you're trying to do? Uh, but it does seem like America is the more brash. Like, like it's, de it's its destiny to go all the way to the coast and fill it with Americans. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Makers. It's hardly surprising that Anglo-American relations could not settle down. Oh my god. I'm not going to do two in a row. Despite the settling. Um, as much as I, I, I think I'm going to do it right now. It's just, I'm, I'm going to put them out uh, one by one. All right, guys. Love y'all. Hope y'all doing well. If you could answer my questions, I would really appreciate it. Or just any comments at all, really appreciate it. Uh, if you could thumbs up and subscribe if you enjoyed watching this with me and want to keep learning, uh, it really, really helps out. Uh, and I would appreciate it. How many times have I said it? Anyways, hope you guys are doing well. See you next time. Bye, guys.